as you're taking your seats, invite you to grab a Bible and open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 4 as we conclude our summer series of going through the second half of the book of Acts, looking at the early church and the life of Paul as examples for how we can follow Jesus as a church in our own lives. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word, we go to him in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would comfort them and enlighten them with the word of God this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they would be comforted and encouraged by the Holy Spirit through the hearing of God's word. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach clearly God's word and the gospel of salvation found in Jesus Christ. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, we're at the end of the book of Acts, and the reading from the book of Acts this morning was incredibly short, and there's a purpose to that. But what I want to do this morning is look at the end of the Apostle Paul's life and answer the question of not just how do we live well as Christians and followers of Jesus, but how do we finish well? And so Paul, at the end of Acts, after the shipwreck and everything, finally makes it to Rome, and he's imprisoned. And so Luke ends uh, chapter 28, the book of Acts, by talking about how, and Paul stayed there for two years. And why this matters is that Paul is under house arrest. He's not in a Roman prison or jail, but he's in house arrest, meaning you can't leave this property. People could come to you, and you can hang out and do whatever you want, but you've got to stay here. And in the Roman uh, judicial system at the time, your accusers were given two years to come and go to court against you and bring their accusations and bring their case against you. And so this is why Luke says, Paul was there for two years, meaning his accusers never ended up showing up. And so Acts just kind of ends with a lot of questions left for us. Because Paul's big dream was to get to Rome, be with the Christians there, preach the gospel. Um, God had told him, you're going to stand before Caesar. And then if you are reading the story of Acts like we have been as a church, you're like, oh, there's this dramatic shipwreck, and they eventually make it to Rome. You're going to have all kinds of questions of, well, did Paul get out of prison? Did he get to do what he wanted to do in Rome? Did he get to stand before Caesar? And Luke just ends. It's like, yeah, he was just there in house arrest. Now, what we do know from not scripture, but from church tradition is that Paul eventually is released from that house arrest and does ministry for a little bit longer. And then he gets put in prison again. But the second time, it's not house arrest. It's prison awaiting his execution. And so at the end of Paul's life is not actually the end of Acts. It's the letter of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is Paul's last uh, writing and last letter that we have in Scripture that he writes at the end of his life, right before his execution and, and martyrdom. And he sends a letter to Timothy. And so this is essentially uh, Pastor Paul's farewell sermon to his friend and student, Timothy. Now, I don't know if you've ever given a farewell sermon before or written a goodbye letter to somebody where things were gonna change, but generally what you do is you try to summarize, here's what I've taught you, here's what I've hoped you've learned, here's what went on in my life, and here's how I can encourage you and comfort you one last time. So as we look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, what we're gonna see is Paul is reflecting on his life, and he's trying to comfort the church and comfort Timothy one last time with the word of God. And he's going to, by doing this, teach you and me how we as Christians can follow his example of how do I live my Christian life well, but how do I finish the race? How do I leave a legacy that points people to Christ? How do I live out my faith all the way to the very end? And so in 2 Timothy chapter four, we're gonna start in verses six, seven, and eight are kind of this little grouping, very famous verses Paul says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. And then probably the most famous verse out of 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. 
How many of you are familiar with that verse, right? Very famous verse, I fought the good fight of faith, I, I ran the race, I, I've kept the faith. Paul's saying, I, I followed Jesus faithfully throughout my life and, I, and I've made it to the end and here's his comfort at the end. He says, henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. So as Paul is saying this, there's a few things that I want us to reflect on in our own lives, in our own faith. So Paul says, very famous words, I have fought the good fight, right? I fought the, the fight of faith. Now, the interesting thing about these words is we tend to think of fighting, right? Because <laughs> that's the word. It says, I have fought the good fight, and I stuck with it and everything. I, I went through all the struggles. I never gave up. Now, here's the deal. Sometimes we think of fighting as picking fights, right? Sometimes we think of fighting as taking a stand on an issue and arguing to the death to try to prove the other side wrong. Anybody ever done that? I mean, I'm sure you've witnessed it, but you're all humble and kind enough you've never done it, right? But Paul isn't talking about this aggression of picking fights, starting wars, or, or, or trying to destroy other people or anything like that. Instead, he uses a Greek word, agonizo, and agona. It's where we get our English word, agony from. Now, fighting the good fight sounds a lot better than a verse that says, I agonized the good agony. How many of you want to agonize over something? I know you have. I have, too. But how many of you are like, I can't wait to be in agony again? Right? Nobody. But fighting the good fight sounds a lot more energetic and, like, Rally the troops, yeah, let's go fight the good fight of faith, right? Now, here's the deal. When I was starting out in ministry, you go through struggles, right? You go through ups and downs in life. Even as pastors, right, we struggle. Even people that serve in ministry as church workers, there's ups and downs in faith. There's struggles. There's wrestling with God. If you don't believe me, read your Bible more, and you'll see how all the prophets were telling God at all the time, I don't want to be a prophet anymore. And God's like, oh, well, here's another thing I want you to say. Okay? <laughs> All right. So I was going through this incredible struggle with God and my faith and depression. All of these things. It was an agony. And so I called up uh, Mike Newman, who is the president of the Texas District, but for most of my life, he was one of my pastors at my home church. He's an incredible mentor, encourager to me um, when I was in high school and college and then even when I was at seminary. And I called him up and I was like, I'm losing my mind, man. I, I'm, I'm ready to not finish the race, right? Because it sounds nice when Paul says it, right? I fought the good fight. I finished the race. How many of you have ever just gotten tired? You're like, I'm tired of the race. Like, I'm, I, I don't want to make it to the finish line. Someone just carry me, Right? I just want to give up. And so I called him, and I was like, I just want to give up. I'm tired. And he's like, well, you're reading your Bible? And I was like, please don't do that right now, right? Like, <laughs> right? And I was like, no. Okay, so even I tell you guys to read your Bible all the time, and see, even I stumble with that, okay? And I was like, no, okay. And he's like, he, he gave me some Bible verses to read. Now, the thing you need to know about Pastor Mike Newman is he loves Greek, and he was one of the guys that got me to fall in love with biblical languages, so when I was in high school, and then I was in college, and I was barely just learning Greek, I wanted to have Bible studies with him. I'd go into his office, and I was like, what does this word mean, and what does this mean, and everything? And he goes over to his shelf, and he grabs a dictionary of Greek-English, and he hands it to me. He goes, it's in there. You just take that, go read it. You'll figure it out. I was like, great. That was awesome. Thanks so much for the help. All right. But he taught me to read it, the Bible, to be in God's word, both in the languages, but also in English, and just reading. And so I'm, I'm struggling. I call him up for encouragement, and he tells me, am I reading my Bible and all this? And he gives me some verses. And one of the verses he gave me was this passage, because Paul is writing to Timothy as a pastor, and he's trying to encourage him of, you could follow my example as a pastor, you could follow my example as a Christian of how to finish the race, how to keep fighting the fight. And of course, he goes, and Mark, I want you to read it in Greek. And I was like, why do you do this to me? All right. But here's the thing. When you read it in the Greek, you see it. It's, I want you to agonize the good agony. Now, here's what Paul 
is talking about. He's summarizing a lot of his teachings because this is his farewell address to Timothy. So he's taking a lot of the things that he's taught, that he's written, that you and I have in the scripture, he's saying, here's my summary of it, my one last parting word of encouragement for you. And the word agonize here, it also means to struggle, and, and it literally had to do with wrestlers, with fighters, with athletes, people that would struggle and strain to achieve victory, to, that they wouldn't give up. They would do all this work to achieve their goal. And that's why he also says, I have finished the race. That's another athlete's language. He's saying, I have run my race. And so throughout Paul's letters, he uses this language of comparing our Christian faith of growing in it and maturing in it and staying faithful with it to professional athletes, people that train like runners to win a race, to do the hard work of and the discipline and the struggle of I'm, I'm going towards a goal. In 1 Corinthians 9, he, he does this as well. And he tells them in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, look at the athletes and how they have self-control because if you're going to get into good shape, if you're gonna be someone that calls yourself an athlete, you know what you need? Self-control. You have to have the self-control, I don't, to say no to donuts. I can't. If you show me a donut, guess what I'm gonna do, even though it's not good for me? Say thank you, and then eat it, all right? Or I'll pretend, oh no, I can't, then I'll take it home and eat it where you can't see me, all right? <laughs> right? But if you're gonna be, as Paul says, uh, this athlete that fights the faith, that, that finishes the race, has the stamina and the energy to actually complete the fight, the match, the contest, the race, you're going to have to have what in your training? Self-control. You're going to have to be able to say no to impulses. You're going to have to say no to a lot of things. Say, that's not good for me because that will not help me achieve my goal of finishing the race, of winning the contest. And in 1 Corinthians 9, as Paul is talking about this, the Greek word for self-control is egokratia. And it literally means ego control. So he's saying, you see how athletes have all this discipline, this ego control, this ability to say no to things that get them off track from their goal. And he tells the church, that's how you need to be as a follower of Jesus. You have to have this ego control, which means... I'm not living for myself. I'm not focused on myself. I'm not running the race for my own glory, my own achievements. I'm running the race for the glory of Jesus to help others, to serve others. And so when Paul says it's a struggle, he's not saying it's a struggle in the sense of like, well, people are mean and bad things happen. He's saying, no, it's a struggle because what we have to fight against is our own egos, our own selfishness, our own self-centeredness. So he tells the church of 1 Corinthians 9, you want to follow Jesus, you need to have ego control. Right? Anybody ever met someone, you go, boy, they've got a really big ego. They're really full of themselves. And Paul says, the opposite should be said about the Christian. That as I run the race, that I fight the good fight, I struggle the struggle. It's not against the world, it's not against other people, it's against my own sinful nature, that I gotta get under control to glorify Jesus. Martin Luther, in his lecture on the book of Romans, says it this way, he says, due to our original sin, our nature is so deeply curved in on itself that it fails to realize that in this wicked, twisted, and crooked way, it seeks all things, including God, for itself. So what Luther is saying is that in our sinful nature that we are so twisted and corrupt, we are so curved in on ourselves. Another place he called ourselves uh, navel gazers, which is one of my favorite uh, Luther quotes, meaning you're just looking at yourself, you're looking at your belly button all the time and going, my life and everything in it is about what? Me. And he says, everything, all of my relationships, my work, everything I do, and then Luther even says, including God himself, we try to use for our own personal gains, right? That instead of loving our neighbor the way Jesus tells us to, we want to use our neighbor to love ourselves. And instead of loving God 
the way Jesus tells us to, right? The two greatest commandments. Luther's saying, instead, we want to just use God for our own gains. I'll go to God when I feel like I need him. I'll go to God when I need a little help. I'll go to God when I want something. But other than that, God is here to to serve me. And so Paul's writing to Timothy and saying, you want to know how to finish well. You want to know how to finish the race. You and I, as human beings, are going to have to have some ego control. And this plays out in everyday decisions you and I have to make. And it is my life about me. So when I interact with you, am I viewing you as a person as, what can I get out of them? How can they serve me? How can they make my life better? Or do I view people as people to be loved and served the way Jesus loved and served me and say, how can I serve them? How can I help them? How can I love them? Right? You and I have a choice to make. There's, those are the two ways we can go throughout the, our lives in the world. Every day you're at work, with your family, with your friends, in your neighborhood, in your church, am I here to get what's mine and make it all about me and how can these people help me? Or is it, no, my ego is under control. I want to... I wanna fight against that sinful nature. I wanna turn out from myself and love people and serve people the way Jesus loved and served me. So the first thing that Paul teaches us, if you wanna finish the race, if you wanna finish well and make your life about the glory of Jesus, you're not gonna like this. (laughs) We We gotta kill our egos. Right, in Philippians, Paul even says it this way, consider everybody else better than yourself. Now, if you've read your Bible, you've seen that verse. How many of you have it in your house as a plaque on your fridge, cross stitch somewhere? Anybody? Yeah, it's okay. Don't, I don't have it in my house either. You know why? Because I like my ego, right? Paul says, I want you to consider everybody else better than yourself. How many of you have at least one person in mind, don't raise your hands, just confess it to the Lord, that you think you're better than in some way? You're all laughing, so I'm just assuming you have a name, okay? (laughs) And Paul's like, no, 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 no. I want you to consider everybody. Why? Because he says that's what Jesus did when he humbled himself to die on a cross for you. He got rid of his ego. He didn't make it about him. He made it about the Father, and about others, you and me. Okay, so Paul says, get your ego under control. Fight the good fight against um, our selfish, sinful nature. Follow Jesus' example of humbling ourselves and making our lives for the betterment of others and loving them for the glory of God. The second thing is that he's going to teach us, this is how you're going to finish well, get to the end of that race. You're gonna have to put your hope in eternity and not tomorrow's circumstances. And that's really hard to do. It's easy when we're in church to go, oh, of course, where's my hope? How many of you would say it's in Jesus, right? He's the ultimate hope, right? We have eternal life in him. We say this every week in the creeds. We proclaim it from God's word. But sometimes it's hard to live with that reality in mind. You don't have to show your hands, but how many of you have ever worried about tomorrow before? Or what's gonna happen the next week? Or what's gonna happen with this thing, or this illness, or this diagnosis, or this job, or whatever, right? We are experts as human beings about worrying. It's ironic that one of the most famous sermons Jesus ever gave, the Sermon on the Mount, includes an entire section that says, don't worry. And we all go, Neat idea, I'll I'll worry about if I'm gonna do it or not, right? But the way you and I change our perspective in this life and able to finish the race and not just throw in the towel, not just give up, is if we follow Paul's example of having our hope set in eternity, not our circumstances. So he says, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, 
and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. All right, so Paul is saying, here's what's happening. Here's how I have finished the race. Here's how I fought the good fight of faith, Timothy. I have put my eyes on Jesus, and I know what is in store for me. In verse six, he says it more blatantly. If you go back to verse six, he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. What Paul is saying in verse six is what? I'm dying. Now, it's probably not from old age or anything. He knew he was under arrest for a reason, and what we know from church history is that he's executed for his faith. But in verse six, Paul says, the end of my race is here. My departure has come. And yet, he still has hope. He still hasn't given up because why? He says, well, because I know it's laid up for me. I have this reward, this crown of righteousness in heaven that's going to last for eternity. Now, the interesting thing is when he uh, talks about departure, he uses a, a traveling term that means to untie. And it was usually used in reference to untying a boat before you set it out for sailing. So Paul is saying, and so a lot of people ended up using this as a metaphor for death. I'm saying, on my departure here, I'm being untied and I'm, I'm getting ready to depart. Now if you think about this image, and this is why eternity matters for our daily lives, it's both sad and also an adventure. Right? Because if you untie a boat and someone starts to sail away, guess what? People are sad because you're having to do what? Say goodbye. Like, goodbye, you're going somewhere else. But at the same time, there is also this excitement of looking forward to what's going to come next. And this is how Paul views his life and his death. He says, it is a departure. He's going to miss Timothy. It's okay for Timothy to grieve the departure and the saying goodbye. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul even tells the church to grieve. Right? Imagine that as a command. He says, I, don't, I want you, brothers and sisters, to grieve the loss of life, their loved ones. And then he says, but I don't want you to do it like the rest of the world. He says, I want you to grieve, but I want you to grieve with hope. And so this is how, in this life, when there is sadness, when there is departure, when there is moments of death and saying goodbye, we can still grieve it. We can say, yes, this is wrong. This is not the way God intended. But we can also, like Paul, do what? Find hope in eternity. Find hope in the fact that when we depart, it's not the end. That we have this crown of righteousness stored up for us that we will be rewarded with. And what I love is that Paul, because I know we've talked about this in previous weeks, Paul is elevated in the church a little bit, right? How many of you think Paul is better than you? Like, when it comes to thinking of people better than you, he's not hard to do, right? You're like, this guy I work with, not better than me. Paul, better than me, right? <laughs> Too many of you are laughing really hard. I'm gonna visit you at your work and find them. All right. <laughs> but what, here's what Paul says. He doesn't just say, and there's for me a crown of righteousness and eternal promise and eternal life, right? He says in verse eight, but it's for all who have what? Loved his appearing. So Paul knows, look, just in case Timothy is struggling in faith, struggling to finish the race, just in case you and me at any point in our life are wrestling with, does God love me? Is there really hope? Or is it just for people like Paul? Paul writes this line, he says, it's not just for me, but it's also for what? It's for all who have loved his appearing. It's for all who love Jesus. See, Paul's able to get to the end of the race. He's able to finish the fight, not because he was really strong on his own, but because he had this hope of whatever the circumstances I'm facing, Whatever the trials are, whatever the struggles are, whatever the departures are, I have an eternal hope that doesn't let me down. So Paul's like, look, I'm, I'm being poured out. My departure is near. 
but I have this promise. And so I can keep proclaiming the gospel, I can keep hoping in God, because I know what is at the end of that departure. I know it's at the end of that saying goodbye, and it's eternal life. So what does this do? If you combine this, I live for others, I have my ego under control, I have a hope for eternity rather than a hope for my circumstances, it changes how you live and how you run the race, how you fight the fight here and now. So if you jump down to verses um, 16 through 18, there's another uh, section here. Paul says this, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. May it not be held against them. How many of you have ever held a grudge? You don't have to raise your hand, just internalize it. Anybody ever gotten really good at holding grudges? Been like, I don't like them. Anybody ever, I've seen this as a pastor, as a human being, I gotten to the point where you've held on to bitterness and a grudge against a person or a group of people for so long that someone asks you, why don't you like them? You say, I don't remember, but I don't like them, right? Here's one of the most astounding things that Paul is doing here. He's saying, I'm in prison now, awaiting my death. And when I was on trial for my life, when I was on, tri- on the trial that led me to being in prison to be executed, guess what happened to me? Not a single person that I did mission and ministry with, not a single person I was friends with, not a single person that was my friend that I wrote letters to came to my defense. He says, they all deserted me. Right, if he was a Texan, remember I've taught you, when you get real angry as a Texan, you say, all y'all. So Paul's saying, all y'all deserted me in my greatest time of need. Now, if I was writing this, I would have put a period there, I would have just ended it and let that sit with them for all eternity, because it's like, well, I'm dying, so here's my last word to you to get, right? Anybody ever been in an argument, disagreement, some kind of, uh, conflict with another human being and your whole goal is I just want to get the last word in. Right? You're like, I just want to get one last punch in, one last hurtful thing in to make sure they know here's how I feel. See, in our sinful nature, when it's all about our ego, when it's all about me, like as, as Luther says, when I've turned in and curved in on myself, that's where I want to end the verse. Just be like, all oh, y'all, you know what you did. You know who you are. You all deserted me. Here's the other thing. If your hope is maybe tomorrow I'll get out of the prison, maybe next week I'll get a stay of the execution, if that's your only hope, guess what? You will hold that grudge against those people as well, right? So if your ego is not under control, if you're turned in on yourself, you say, my life is all about me, you end verse 16 very differently than the Apostle Paul did. You end it like I would, as a sinner, which is, you all know what you did. You all deserted me. If your hope is only in your circumstances of, I'll forgive you if I get out of the prison, I'll forgive you if I get through this and they don't execute me. Guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna, hold, you're gonna hold on to a heck of a grudge. But Paul doesn't end it there. He says this. He says, may it not be charged against them. I mean, you would come to Paul and be like, Paul, don't you know what they did? Right? How many of you have ever gossiped to a friend to let them know what someone else did and they should hold the grudge with you? Right? No, you don't, you don't know that. Or you get angry if they are nice to them. Don't you know what they did? Right? You're crazy, Paul. How could you possibly say, but don't hold it against them? And let it not be charged. Don't even accuse them of it. Don't even bring it up anymore. You will live and you will run a race 
totally different from the rest of the world. If you follow the example of Paul, you, you fight the good fight against your own ego. And you say, my life is not about me. It's about loving my neighbor. It's about loving Jesus. You will run a race totally differently than the rest of the world. And you will fight the good fight of faith. You will make it to the end and finish well if you put all of your hope in eternity and the reward that Christ will offer to you rather than your circumstance of, oh, I'll live differently and I'll treat them differently and I'll love them and I'll forgive them if I get out of the prison. See, this totally changes our, our way of thinking, our way of viewing people and how we live and how we run the race as Christians. Now to wrap it up, there's one last thing that you need to know about Paul. Jesus was his friend. All of this comes together. Your ability to make your life about Jesus and loving others out of obedience to him, your ability to put all of your hope in eternity and not your circumstances depends totally on this reality that you have a friendship with Jesus. Now here's the thing, friendship with Jesus is different than just knowledge of Jesus. You can know a lot about him, you can know the facts, you can read the stories, but friendship means he is with you in your everyday life. He is with you in those difficult circumstances when it feels like agony and life is a struggle and you wanna give up on the race. So Paul says it this way, everybody deserted me, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. The word strengthen um, comes from a medical term, means to nurse back to health, to bind up wounds. Because if you're completely abandoned by everybody you know, everybody that you consider a friend, everybody that loved you, that you loved, in their hardest moment of your life, most difficult circumstance you've ever faced, you would have some wounds that need care, right? You would have some, some hurts that need binding and healing. And what Paul says, everybody else deserted me and abandoned me, but the Lord stood by me. And the Lord strengthened me, bound up my wounds, healed me up. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24 says, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And in John chapter 15, Jesus looks at all of his disciples and he says, no longer do I call you servants, but now I call you my friends. And then he says very famously, there is no greater love than this than if someone gives up his life for his friends. And he looks at his disciples and says, and that is who you are. See, you're only going to finish well, not give up on the race. You're only gonna be able to kill your ego and love others and think of them better than yourself. You're only gonna find hope in eternity and not your circumstances if you know Jesus as your friend. And here's the beauty of Proverbs 18, 24. It's talking about Jesus. Because he's the only friend that sticks around in our greatest hurts. He's the only one that stood by Paul when Paul was abandoned. And here's the beauty of Jesus. It's because he went through it all. Hebrews says that he's been through everything that we've already been through. He's been tempted in every way that we've been tempted to so that we can find hope. So when Jesus is on trial, guess what happens to him, if you know the stories? Everybody does what? Abandons him and leaves him. When he's standing on trial and when he's facing persecution, when he's facing death, Everybody that says they loved him, everybody that knew him, abandons him and runs away, just like Paul. And then when he's on the cross, facing his moment of death, he feels what? Completely alone. So Paul is going through many of the things that Jesus went through. He's facing trial, everybody abandons him. He's facing death, and he's all alone, except for this one difference. On the cross, when Jesus is dying and he's been totally abandoned, he looks up to the Father and he cries out, 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is he saying? I, I cried out to the Father, and he did not stand with me. I cried out to the Father, and he did not strengthen me. And yet, here's why this matters. Luther calls it the great exchange. See, on the cross, Jesus gets everything you and I deserve. We are navel gazers. We are turned in on ourselves. We are turned away from God, and we deserve to be on the cross and have the Father do what? Turn away from us. And yet, on the cross, Jesus is forsaken. The Father turns away from him so that he will turn to us like he did with Paul in our time of need. That on the cross, Jesus is abandoned by God so that he will stand with us, right? Paul looks at his friends and he says, everybody abandoned me. But what did the Lord do for Paul? He stood with him. And on the cross, Jesus is broken, he's wounded, and he dies so that you and I can be healed. So Paul is standing there and he goes, and then the Lord strengthened me. He nursed me back up. He healed my wounds, and he gave me life. See, you and I can say that Jesus is our friend who stands with us and strengthens us in our time of need, in our struggles, in our difficult circumstances, because that's who he is. He is our good friend who stands by us and strengthens us and never abandons us. And if you know that Jesus is your friend, you will be able to run the race. You will be able to fight the fight. And like Paul, you will be able to finish and face your departure and say, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And when the world goes, how can you possibly do that? (laughs) You go, because Jesus is my friend who stands by me and strengthens me. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the friend who sticks closer than a brother. That on the cross, you were forsaken and had the Father turn away from you so that we could be friends with God, and that he would turn to us and stand with us in our time of need. We give thanks that on the cross, you were broken and wounded and killed so that we may be strengthened and healed and that we may face our departure with hope, knowing that there is a crown of righteousness stored up for us. Holy Spirit, may you strengthen us to run the race, to fight the good fight of faith, so that more people will know the love of Jesus and salvation in his name. Amen.